Hi, Nick. Hey, Sama. Hey. I made you a co-host as well. Okay, cool. Thanks for joining us. Veronica's yeah. uh, said she's taking her dog out uh, <laughs> <laughs> before we start. It's a good thing. Good I thing to so. out before she starts. <laughs> yeah, have I ever told you when I when I defended my my PhD, I was staying with some friends in Anchorage, and they had a dog, and I ignored the dog all morning because I was preparing mm -hmm. for my defense. Uh, mm -hmm. we were doing it on Skype and uh, mm -hmm. so I ignored it all morning they were both off at work and then I started at noon sort of like this and the dog had, was full of energy and uh, <laughs> so yeah it was probably you know 20 minutes into the presentation or something <laughs> like that really? but I was I was attacked by a, a very sweet little you know pit bull kind of a creature funny yeah. that was Everyone. your icebreaker it, it, it truly was yeah it, i couldn't have planned it better you you're on to it it's just the thing sometimes oh my god i, I heard the um, part about dogs yeah mine will <laughs> definitely come in and make himself known also <laughs> yeah. hi veronica i'm sama hi nice to meet you i love your headband thank you thank you an Alaskan artist. Oh, perfect. Oh I'm obsessed God. with headbands. <laughs> I just figured I yeah. should make my hair look like, like I should make the curls look like something today. I don't know. <laughs> Usually it's just pulled back in a ponytail. You know, in my case is that I, I like to have my hair uh, loose, but I don't like it in my face. Yep. Yep. I hate Same. it in my face. Yeah same i was like i'll just i'll just uh <laughs> it's <laughs> been a long time since i've had to like look presentable so <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it happens to all of us where are you calling from <laughs> veronica um i'm currently in anchorage um i just spent my last three weeks on saint paul uh oh. so still kind of like coming off being in the field mode <laughs> uh-huh yeah uh, uh, transition yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I we had lovely weather out there and mm -hmm. we got to get out on the boat and do some surveys and do some fun stuff with the kids. So it was, mm -hmm. oh, and cool. I hadn't been there for almost two years. So it was nice to, to go home. <laughs> uh -huh. Awesome. Yeah, so a, Veronica really just got in, you know, like yesterday or something. <laughs> the, the fact that she's she's here and is, is <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. We really it was dicey it. there. There was a chance that my flight was going to get canceled, and I was yeah, like, tra traveling in, yeah, traveling in uh, Western Alaska. You, yeah, when it's nice yeah. in Anchorage, doesn't guarantee you if I'm, yeah, the connections exactly. between the Bering Seas team uh, yeah. bit disjointed well, at times. And Raven is just, it's like they almost fly when they just want to sometimes, and you're like, but I got to get, I got to get where I need to go. And like, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Anchorage for the most part. I feel like my heart goes out to people who have to like come out here for medical and things like that. Like, yeah. you know, they miss so much time working and they have to like find housing out here or in a hotel or rent a car. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's not easy. It's not easy. And like, mm -hmm. you know, having to depend on an undependable airline is not fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it just adds one more thing. Close weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, well, I'm going to hit the start webinar button here and it, It'll let folks in. Let's see. And I've got it recording. So I'll just dive in. I've got some sort of housekeeping stuff just to give an introduction. And then I'll pass it off to you, Veronica. Awesome. And Sama, yeah, you and I can kind of probably hide in the background, just mute it for a good portion of it, too. Welcome everyone to today's Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar. Uh, this session is entitled Microplastic Pollution 
and the effects of phthalates and other plastic-borne chemicals on Alaska's ecosystems and Alaskans' health. My name is Nick Reardon, and I'll be hosting today's Che Alaska webinar on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics. And so I'm here in the office today in Anchorage, um, and just take a moment to, to note that these are the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina people. And so we'd like to acknowledge and thank the stewards of this place and invite you all to do the same for the many places that you're calling in from today. A little, a little background for those new to these calls, these webinars, uh, is that Che Alaska is a regional partner of a national collaborative on health and environment organization. And uh, together, Che and Che Alaska and other Che partners, we're working to advance knowledge and action around the growing concerns associated with links between human health and a variety of environmental factors, some of which we'll touch on today. So uh, you can check out our websites to learn more at akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. So as usual, the session will last an hour. And we have our guest today, uh, Veronica Pajula, is uh, presenting on her work around microplastic pollution and associated chemical contamination. Um, and then we'll, we'll have time at the end of the hour, you know, 15, 20 minutes, whatever is left over for uh, some questions and, and answers session. So feel free to type in using Zoom's Q&A feature. Uh, there's a button at the bottom of your screen, um, as well as at any time during the presentation. So it's not distracting to us. You can type away in there. And um, yeah, so we're joined today by Veronica Pajula, and she is the Academic Program Director at the Bering Sea Campus and Research Center uh, at Aleut, Aleut Community of St. Paul Island. Um, Veronica received her Master's in Fisheries from the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 2013 and is currently working on her PhD at the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at UAF, investigating the impacts of plastic marine debris and phthalate exposure on Bering Sea food webs. Her work also explores trends in marine debris uh, in this region, as well as threats to subsistence species uh, on St. Paul Island. So Veronica, welcome back from your field work. We're so delighted that you, uh, yeah, you're able to join us today. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll turn the mic over to you. Awesome, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this webinar today. I really appreciate it. Um, and as Nick was saying, uh, I'm sort of in the throes of completing my PhD at the moment. So this is good practice for, for me to sort of share my ideas and my thoughts and, and help you know have a conversation with um, a very knowledgeable crowd um, to, to sort of help you know hash out where I'm going with my research in the future. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm currently located in Anchorage on Dodina land, but a lot of my work happens um, in the Aleutian Islands and in the Pribilof Islands on St. Paul. So um, I would also like to acknowledge the Unangan peoples who inhabit those islands. Um, they have been a huge part of the work I've done and have really taught me so much um, and brought me to where I am today in terms of the work that I'm doing. I'm going to share my screen and kick off um, my presentation. So um, just so you know, I've sort of, I'm trying sort of a new thing and how I discuss the work that um, I've been doing sort of through my graduate work, but also the work that we've been doing um, as, as a member of the, you know, as an employee of the Elliott Community of uh, St. Paul Island Tribal Government. And I sort of broke this into three sections and, and I can actually, you know, I was talking to Nick earlier, but I could, I could even, if, if questions pop up sort of towards the end of every section, I'm happy to stop and answer some questions kind of in, in the moment, um, but also very happy to discuss anything at the end. So I really wanted to talk about sort of the big issue of marine debris and plastic pollution first, um, and then uh, dive more deeply into my graduate research around um, sort of the toxicological consequences of plastic pollution and um, my research with phthalates. And then because I've spent so much of my research sort of looking at the problem, um, I've spent the past maybe two or three years also trying to think about solutions. Um, and so I wanted to sort of wrap up uh, this webinar with uh, one of the ways that we've been working on St. Paul Island to, to think about 
solutions or preventative measures to tackle the issue of marine debris and plastic pollution. Um, so like I said, you know, if anything pops up, um, Nick, feel free to interrupt and I can answer a question in real time if, um, if that feels uh, like, you know, something that we want to talk about. So also, um, I just want to acknowledge that a lot of these pictures um, actually come from Kodiak Island by a wonderful photographer named Max. Um, I was invited by the Island Trails Network, <laughs> like at the last minute in May, to join them on a marine debris cleanup in Kodiak and Afognak at the beginning of June. And it was like a really awesome, wonderful experience. And um, he graciously shared some of his beautiful photography with us. So um, that's what you kind of see in some of the background. Um, <laughs> you'll, know, you'll know when it's my picture because it's just not nearly as beautiful. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure I said that at the beginning as well. Oops, let's see if I, oh, there it goes. Okay, sorry, my computer yelled at me. Let me see if I can go back on my slide. One more, there it is. Um, so first I wanted to sort of wrap our minds around um, this idea of plastic production and how it goes from being an item that we use to an item that is waste and polluting the environment. And I know I'm sort of talking to sort of you know, talking to a crowd that that understands this concept already, but um, you know, when I started this work with marine debris and plastic pollution, I was really looking at it at, at the end of that plastic materials life cycle when it's become waste and it is polluting the environment and how that impacts the environment or communities in and of themselves. But as I dove deeper into this work and thought more about, you know. I'll sort of wrap back around to the environmental justice issues that I that I've sort of thought about in the context of marine debris. But um, at every point in the production of plastic materials, there is an environmental impact. Um, most plastic materials are petroleum based, so there's a whole extraction process that is impacting the environment as well because um, the gas and oil industry is very tightly connected to plastic production. And so there's a whole extraction process that impacts landscapes and communities. Um, and then the production process of plastic has its own impacts in terms of creating like waste side products that then can potentially leak into the environment either through the air or through the water. The other thing about production that, um, you know, has sort of been tackled a bit at this point, but way back when we were starting to like use plastics really heavily, um, plastics aren't sort of, they don't, when they're first produced, they don't, they don't come in their final form, right? They don't come as a bottle or, or a container or something like that. They're actually these little pellets of plastic that then get shipped to other manufacturers that melt them down and create the product that they need. But these pellets or, you know, in uh, sort of more slang terms, these nurdles, these plastic nurdles, um, were also a big source of pollution for a very long time because they were unregulated. And many of these little tiny pieces of plastic that were these virgin plastics were getting into the environment as well. But then we have like our, our use phase where all of us are using plastics, um, you know, unless you're kind of living completely off the grid, there is something in your life that is made of plastic that you use. Um, you know, I'm talking to you from a computer that has plastic in it at some point in it. You know, um, we all are using these materials. Um, but when, when I get sort of into the idea of the toxicological consequences of plastic pollution and marine debris, um, you know, we are, we are touching pieces of plastic that might contain chemicals on them that can get into our systems as well. And then finally, sort of the thing that we really focus in on is this waste phase. Um, and it's not just the disposal of like the poor management of disposed plastics, right? We, you know, I think the last check on how much plastic we recycle is about 9% of the waste, of the plastic waste we create. That's not a lot. And for a big part, of what we were doing in terms of our waste management, we were sending our garbage to China. <laughs> um, if we were putting it on barges and sending it over to China and they were sort of tackling um, not just the waste in, the waste that was created within China itself, but other countries' waste as well. That um, has since not existed since about, I think the year was 2018 when China instituted its sword policy and it sort of stopped taking other countries' waste. I don't blame them, <laughs> um, but it left 
a lot of countries like the United States and you know European countries kind of holding the bag for the waste that was created within their borders and what to do with it. And so um, things like poor landfill management, poor water waste management um, have resulted in more waste getting into the environment because we don't necessarily know how to deal totally well with the waste we create. Um, the other issue is that in some places, um, the sort of solution to the waste, to plastic waste, is to burn it. Um, <laughs> and so um, burning plastic just means that you know you're changing it to another form and putting particulates into the air that can that are also polluting the air. So um, plastic is, ne is nefarious. Plastic waste gets everywhere. Um, it's in the air. It's in the water. It's in the soil. Um, it's in lots of places. I'm really starting out like with a high point here, but I promise I'll wrap around and like um, get to sort of the good things people are doing. <laughs> So with all of that said, um, you know, this is something that I try and do personally um, as, I, as I move through life is to consider the life cycle of the plastic containers and items that we all use daily. Um, this is a milk jug that we found in Kodiak. Um, and I'll talk more a little, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of my experience in doing marine debris cleanup in Kodiak um, versus St. Paul. But um, you know, these are common items that we find during our marine debris cleanup that you know, it has that little recycle symbol around the number two, and yet it hasn't been recycled, it's just been thrown away and um, its life ends as like a piece of debris on the beach. But um, whenever we are using these plastic containers, it's really important for us to consider like where it goes after we're done with it. Um, whether it's recycled or thrown away. And, you know, I, I say this in the context that recycling is not an easy thing to do. It's not really well done across the country. But then when you consider how remote Alaska as a state is, um, recycling within Alaska itself is a difficult thing to do as well. So um, sometimes we have to consider recycling being part of the solution, but not the entire solution to tackling um, the plastic pollution crisis. So there was a recent study that came out in 2020 um, that estimated what, how much um, different countries were putting into the environment in terms of plastic waste. This was actually in response to like a famous paper that was, um, sorry, let me close my door. Um, uh, a famous paper that was published in 2015 by Jenna Jambach and her colleagues um, which was really the first modeling of how much plastic waste was getting into the ocean annually. And, and when you hear sort of like the 8 million tons, 8 million metric tons of debris of plastic getting into the ocean every year, um, that's quoted quite a bit. It's coming from um, that particular paper. So in 2020, they updated it because one of the messages that seemed to be taken and, and somewhat misinterpreted from that 2015 paper was that the big culprit were was like countries in Asia. That was, you know, the big culprit. That was the, the group of countries that were putting the most waste into the environment. And from 2015 forward, that seemed to be a benchmark and a place to concentrate efforts in terms of tackling plastic waste. Um, and not that that's wrong, but it was a bit of a misinterpretation of like who was really the culprit here. Um, and this updated paper really wanted to reiterate the idea that like, actually um, the US is one of the biggest culprits in terms of putting the most plastic waste into the environment, um, especially coastal communities. And I say this because I wanna point out, and this is like a lot of the work that I do from sort of um, a lens of environmental justice. We say the US, but it's not all of the US, um, it's, probably heavily populated coastal communities in the US or places where industry exists. Um, when I think about Alaska and the coastal communities that I have the privilege of working in and working with, you know, a community like St. Paul Island of 400 people with no industry isn't necessarily responsible for um, putting all of this plastic waste into the environment. 
And so these generalizations, like that generalization of Asian countries being the biggest culprits from that 2015 paper, um, this sort of general idea that the US is putting the most plastic debris into the environment um, has nuance and has, um, ha you have to dig a little bit deeper to really understand the complexity of the issue and who is really impacted by this problem. So I took this quote um, from a United Nations Environment Program report that just came out. If you're really interested in um, looking at it, it's a really interesting paper that is very eye-opening in terms of thinking about um, how marine debris is a matter of environmental justice and that there are lots of communities, lots of coastal and island communities worldwide that are disproportionately impacted by the marine debris crisis. But you know, this quote says more pollution leaking into the ocean means more dead zones, increased ocean acidification and less absorption of CO2. The prevalence of microplastics in the oceans along with acidification kill the bottom of the food chain is a serious threat to biodiversity and the food chain as a whole. Many cultures that depend on fish as their main source of protein may face malnourishment as they may not be able to afford any other source of protein. They may be forced to change their diets in a way that could be even more detrimental to the environment with the purchasing of imported foods that are pre-packaged. There's a lot going on there, um, but I think it highlights this idea that I just said that marine debris is a complex issue. And um, in order to tackle it, we have to really accept its true complexity and, and really look at it from many different angles and perspectives in order to um, solve this issue, which you know doesn't happen overnight, but I think uh, step by step, we can get there. So um, that kind of brings me to sort of the second bit of this big idea of marine debris and plastic pollution. Um, I want to focus in on Alaska a little bit more because all across Alaska, people are working hard to fight against this issue. And these are some more pictures from our cleanup in Kodiak. Um, I don't know the final number that they collected because they were going to do a second trip out to Katmai, um, but several tons of debris were definitely taken off the shoreline in a fog neck. And I want to say it was Whale Island was the other island that we went to um, on our trip. But I just want to reiterate this idea that while these communities are often disproportionately impacted by the marine debris crisis and marine debris ending up on their shorelines, um, they're still putting in the time to tackle it. <laughs> Basically, they're tackling other people's trash, which you know is part of this whole environmental justice issue. Um, some more, I just want to sort of you know highlight this idea that there are people working hard. So some more uh, numbers and pictures from marine debris removal in at least St. Paul and Kodiak. This is St. Paul here. Um, this is from our 2019 marine debris cleanup. We um, managed to pick up, oops, sorry. Um, we managed to pick up a lot of garbage and a couple slides later, I'll, I'll show you exactly how it panned out for 2019. But I just wanted to really capture this idea that marine debris removal takes work. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six people tackling this fishing line um, that has been wrapped up around uh, driftwood on this rocky beach. And it took them at least a half hour to remove this line. But it was really important that we got these big pieces of debris off the shoreline. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap back around to why it's really important to you know, put the time and effort into pieces of debris like this, um, because that leads into my next conversation about you know, my personal research with phthalates. It's lots of work. So I wanted to sort of contrast um, the St. Paul Island group with our Kodiak group. And actually, I would say that um, the teen in the picture, she's actually from St. Paul Island and she went on, me, went on this trip with me. Um, but they spent a solid hour disentangling this net from um, this giant tree. And so, you know, while the driftwood is kind of like thin and like, easily picked up on St. Paul, uh, Kodiak is different because it's forested and we just have like giant roots that everything gets tangled in and you just gotta get your knife in there and kind of cut away everything to really get these, I mean, probably hundred pounds or more of net 
from this um, forested area. But I just, you know, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of labor, it's also a lot of money um, because, you know, it's, it's the time that people put into it, but it's also gas to get to these sites. Um, and then there's the whole end portion of like, what do we do with all this debris we create, we collected, where does it go? We have to pay to, you know, get it to a landfill also. So from St. Paul in 2019, um, the community members collected over 200,000 pounds of debris. And that was in about, I think it was six days. Um, we didn't cover all the shorelines on St. Paul, one because some are like extremely rocky and at the base of cliffs and very dangerous to try and remo remove debris from, but also um, we, you know, we concentrated on one of our catcher beaches on the North shore. And from that, you know, that section of shore on the North beach, we were able to remove 20,000 pounds. You'll see in our pie chart that more than half of it was um, fishing gear, rope and line. Um, and you could see from that previous picture that rope was very heavy. <laughs> um, and that made up quite a bit of the debris we removed from our shoreline. And I just want to reiterate that, you know, St. Paul Island is a fishing community. Um, it's, but it's a long lining community um, targeting halibut. And a lot of these uh, nets and line that we collected were probably coming off trawlers. Um, and so it, it sort of highlights this idea that the debris that the community members are working very hard and tirelessly to remove from their shorelines are probably coming from other places and not actually originating from the island itself. And that's, that's sort of a trend across a lot of these coastal and island communities. They are removing other people's or other industries debris. And so the, the last part of my research um, is actually more of a social, social science chapter. And um, part of it involved doing interviews with St. Paul Island community members. And I was trying to capture sort of their observations of changes in marine debris over time, but also what are their concerns about the marine debris issue. And I wanted to conclude this section with that part because it sort of brings us into the next part also. Um, one of the biggest things that came out of my conversations with um, community members from St. Paul was um, the real concern that marine debris has in terms of impacts to wildlife. And it, it was an interesting experience because you know these ideas around subsistence resources being impacted did come up, but what really, what really came up in conversation was just a general concern for the lives of these animals, not because it is something we depend on, but because these animals deserve to live healthy lives just as much as we do as humans, which I thought was really, you know, is really encapsulating of, of my experience with um, St. Paul Island community members overall, but also um, I think, uh, Tugs that, you know, it hits, hits home for me too, because that's why I've done a lot of this work is not because, you know, a seabird on Atu Island eating plastic is, you know, is impacting me directly, but because seabirds on Atu shouldn't be subjected to the waste we create or mistake plastic for food. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's been one of sort of the deeper connections I've felt with community members on St. Paul Island is just this real like love of wildlife for wildlife's existence. But, you know, they mentioned a lot of these things that we talk about quite often in terms of the um, broader impacts of marine debris um, when it comes to wildlife, which includes entanglement in nets and line, um, ingestion of plastic, chemical exposure through that ingestion, um, you know, possible starvation and death, and the, you know, potential that these impacts will cause population declines in the future. The other thing that really came up in conversation was this idea of like, you know, will it ever end? Is this just an ongoing thing that we're gonna to have to face all the time? Um, and, and some suggestions of, of how we tackle this issue is, you know, working to stop waste at its source. Um, identifying the source of the waste is a whole other thing that we need to do, but also needing to hold polluters responsible for their actions. Um, and this was in particular, you know, thinking about plastic manufacturers, fishing industry, um, 
just big polluters in general? Um, and how do we how do we sort of incorporate their actions into um, finding solutions and holding them accountable? So you know, I'm still working on finishing up uh, writing that manuscript and that and uh, sort of figuring out how how best to like encapsulate all of this. But um, these are just some of the things that have come out of those conversations, and I think it's important to share those um, with a broader community because I. You know, my gut says that there are other island and coastal communities in Alaska who have similar concerns and um, voicing those concerns when it comes to policy and management of marine debris issues is going to be really important. Okay, so what does this all have to do with my research? Well, um, I'm going to introduce you to two uh, terms that we often use in the plastics pollution world, macroplastics and microplastics. And I'm sure some of you out there have heard of them. Um, macro meaning big. And so a lot of the things that we collect off the shorelines are what we would consider macroplastics. Um, the problem is that the longer they stay in the ocean, the longer they get hit by waves, the longer plastic gets hit by sunlight and photo degrades, the more susceptible it is to breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces which the smaller pieces are what we call microplastics. And that's where we're gonna sort of head next. Um, how do we tackle the issue of microplastics? It's important to remember that um, while, you know, there might be a sense of these marine debris cleanups, you know, can be a band-aid on a gushing wound. We're just cleaning up a shoreline to, you know, find debris again the next year. Um, taking the, the debris off the shoreline and making it less possible for it to degrade into microplastics is really important because trying to clean microplastics out of the environment um, <laughs> is extremely difficult. And I'll just tell one anecdote from our uh, Kodiak trip. There were a couple spots that we went to that um, basically got hit by pieces of polystyrene or styrofoam. And you, you know, like, hopefully y'all can imagine what styrofoam looks like. It's just these like little white balls all kind of stuck together that if you broke it, all the balls like pop off and go everywhere. Um, I likened it to a very morbid snow globe, um, but we went to a couple spots where, you know, it was just broken down polystyrene and we could spend hours there and we still wouldn't get every last piece of polystyrene off those beaches or that forest floor. Um, and that's really the big thing to consider is that <laughs> microplastics are very hard to clean out of the environment. Macroplastics, a little bit easier. Um, the other thing that I would say is that things like those nets, um, those little fibers, those little plastic fibers that make up the nets um, can really like uh, break off very easily. And those little microfibers or microplastics are also extremely difficult to clean out of the environment or um, when we think about wastewater treatment or anything like that, wastewater treatments are not geared towards cleaning things like microplastics and microfibers out of the water. And so what we're gonna concentrate on when we think about the impacts of marine debris, you know, we, we sort of talked about all these different things, um, except maybe non-native species, but we can get back to that a little bit. But I wanna focus in on this idea around ingestion. So my research, also looks at um, seabirds in the Aleutian Islands and their susceptibility to um, possibly ingesting plastic as you know in this form of microplastics, but also um, what are sort of the lingering consequences of ingesting plastic or having plastic in the environment around them. How did this come about? So um, before I started working on St. Paul Island, I was doing my research research on the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the study that we started way back, God, um, 2009, um, was an effort to look at what seabirds across the Aleutian chain are eating. Um, this food web project was in response to seeing declines in certain populations of birds in certain regions across the refuge. And, you know, in ecology, um, one of the things that we talk about is this idea or this concept of you are what you eat. So if you're not getting good nutrition, um, that can be reflected in declining populations. So that's where we started. 
And these are our birds that helped us learn all about what's going on in the Aleutian Islands. So um, our 10, 10 species that we worked with are, you know, from left to right, uh, red-faced cormorant, tufted puffin, below that is northern fulmar. Um, in the middle, that little black and white bird with the red feet is pigeon guillemot. Up on top is the horn puffin. Down below is black legged kittiwake. Um, in the middle, that black shiny bird is pelagic cormorant. Up on top, again, next to the cormorant to um, the right of it is common burr. Below that is glaucous wingle. And then our final one is our crested auklet. And so it's really valuable in the work that we do to look across this broad swath of species because seabirds, um, these seabirds themselves are one, um, all sampling from different parts of the food web. So, um, you know, a bird like a crested auklet is getting plankton from the surface, but a bird like um, a murr or a puffin is diving lower below the surface for fish. So they're taking different animals from the environment and they're all, you know, doing something in terms of responding to what's there. The other thing that I want to point out um, why we choose seabirds to study is that seabirds are really important environmental sentinels, um, especially for the ocean. So their health, their reproductive success, their population numbers and trends um, all tell us something about what's going on in the ocean in the bigger picture. And on top of that, um, we choose seabirds for as environmental sentinels in, in the sense that, you know, there's a certain point in their life where they have to come to land in order to breed. You can't, you know, lay an egg in the middle of the water. That doesn't really work. So they spend part of their lives during the year on land, which is the point at which scientists can access them and study them. And so that's why they act as important environmental sentinels also. Um, I'll give you an example. If anybody remembers the big seabird die off, um, around 2016, we had lots of MERS dying off in different parts of uh, the coastal you know, regions of Alaska. Um, that is part of what these birds do in terms of serving as environmental sentinels. It isn't normal to have thousands and thousands of birds dying off at the same time. And we, as scientists, observed this happening and said, this isn't right, we need to know more. And so while it's tragic that we lost so many lives of birds in the process, um, it was a signal to us to, to look deeper into what was happening in the ocean. Um, I could probably talk all day about how wonderful seabirds are, but I have more to tell you and I only have a half hour left. So we'll move on. Um, the birds that we work with are coming from all parts of the Aleutian Islands. Um, this is a map that I used in my publication of these data. Um, and what you'll see is that we sampled birds from um, wrapped in green, the Western region of the Aleutian Islands, wrapped in yellow with the sea, the central region of the Aleutian Islands, and wrapped in blue with the, knee, the Eastern region of the Aleutian Islands. And this was a really important part of the work we did because um, we, we wanted to get, you know, when we were originally working on the food web ecology, we wanted to be able to have a geographic spread and be able to do comparisons across geography to better understand, you know, is something different happening in the eastern part of the, the Aleutians in comparison to the western part of the Aleutians. But I also just want you to keep this in mind from um, sort of a plastic pollution perspective and a toxicological perspective. Um, the way the currents in red are flowing are really important to consider when um, how plastic in the ocean moves around on the currents. I didn't really get into that um, too deeply when I, when I was talking about plastic pollution, but um, sort of just circling back to this idea that like, you know, plastic in that becomes waste in, you know, say like Australia does have potential for making it all the way to the US because the ocean is a big place and the currents move everything around, but it also has the potential for making it to the Aleutian Islands. Um, and you can see the little offshoots on the red, um, on the thicker red arrows that kind of indicate where smaller like circular currents are happening, um, where there might be places that like catch and keep debris in one space. Um, 
but we can we can sort of hash that out later if anybody has any questions around that. So um, what we did was we collected seabird samples and when we want to know what they're eating, we look inside their stomachs. And on doing that, the first year that we were sampling seabirds, we started finding evidence of plastic ingestion in our birds. And it wasn't every bird, um, but it was enough for us to be like, hey, this is not cool. Um, like I said, we started our work in 2009. And by that time, it wasn't a secret that seabirds in certain regions of the world were highly susceptible to ingesting plastic. Um, the classic example are the albatross in Hawaii that have been found to um, not only ingest plastic themselves from the Pacific Ocean, but also um, feed their chicks the plastic. And there have been you know, numerous chicks found dead on, on, in colonies like on Midway, um, where you, know, you see like the body, it's, it's a gory image. And I'm also keeping a very gory image on the screen right now, I'll move forward. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's the bones and the feathers of the bird and then right in the center is just like a pile of lighters and small pieces of plastic and toothbrushes. Um, and so it wasn't a secret that there were certain birds in certain regions of the world that were susceptible to this but we didn't really think about it in the context of the seabirds in the Aleutian Islands also being susceptible to plastic ingestion. And the other thing about it was when it, when it came to something like the albatross, it was really obvious that this was happening because the albatross you know, live in these colonies where people can go and study them and see the evidence of the plastic ingestion in either the dying chicks or um, you know, the other thing that albatross will do is they create boluses. So they regurgitate food that they can't digest. And um, scientists, as, as a part of studying albatross, will collect the boluses and look inside of those to see what the bird may have been eating. And that's where they were finding evidence of plastic pollution over and over again. Seabirds in, in the Aleutians, you know, those 10 species don't create boluses. And we weren't seeing like, you know, chicks bodies with plastic around it. So it wasn't on our minds. The other thing, and I'll, I'll go back to this in a sec, in a moment. Um, the other thing that was happening is that these pieces of plastic that we were finding are these microplastics, um, are these smaller pieces, not lighters and not toothbrushes. And so we started to think, well, maybe the birds aren't starving to death. Um, from ingesting the microplastics, but it can't be good that they're eating plastic. Even if it's like something that starts in their stomach and then gets passed through their intestine and out the other side, it's just not a great idea to um, ingest plastic. And as we dug a little bit deeper, there was other research coming out that said that as plastic hangs out in the ocean, it is able to absorb other chemicals onto its surface. Um, plastic basically can act like a sponge. So um, you can see in this picture here, the little um, circles are the different types of plastic and the sizes of the chemical compounds tell you how capable it is, like that type of plastic, how capable, capable it is of absorbing that chem those like particular chemicals. And in the case of this study with this picture that I'm showing you here, um, they were looking at um, persistent organic pollutants. And so the thought was that, well, these birds could ingest these pieces of plastic that also have chemicals in them. And then those chemicals could leach off from the plastic into the bird's bodies. And then the, bir the birds are suddenly exposed to these various chemicals. For us, um, we didn't hone in on uh, organic pollutants ourselves, we actually honed in on a different type of chemical group called phthalates. Phthalates are plasticizing chemicals. Um, they are esters of phthalic acid. They're additives in plastic. So basically what happens is when people are making different plastic materials, they will coat those plastic materials with a type of phthalate um, that will add clarity, durability, um, waterproofing, all sorts of things to it. Um, there are 25 kinds of phthalates. Um, and when they're in use, they actually don't bind to the polymer, the plastic polymer matrix. 
um, they just sit on top of the plastic. And so that makes them highly susceptible to leaching. And I'll just tell you, as I was learning about phthalates, I'm not an anal analytical chemist myself. I am an ecologist and an ecotoxicologist. But as I started to dive more deeply into phthalates, uh, it got pretty overwhelming because they are used in lots of things um, and they're everywhere around us. Um, one of the weirdest and just like kind of most frightening example that I found as I was learning about this is that phthalates are often used in personal care products or soaps. Um, they act as an emulsifier, so they give it like that gelatinous quality. And that is when I decided that I would specifically look for personal care products that said phthalate free, because <laughs> I did not need plasticizing chemicals on my body. Um, but, you know, they can aerosolize, so they can get into the air and we can breathe it in. Um, some things, you know, you can touch certain surfaces and the phthalates will sort of transfer from the surface to your skin. Um, they're really nefarious because they're just located everywhere. And very few of those congeners are highly regulated by say like EPA. There are six that are um, contaminants of concern, six of those 25 um, that were indicated by EPA to be contaminants of concern. Um, these are the six here. And we have dimethyl phthalate, diethyl phthalate, uh, butyl benzyl phthalate, dien butyl phthalate, dien octyl phthalate, and uh, DEHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate. Diethyl hexyl phthalate is one of the most common ones, mostly because it was used in medical equipment. Um, you'll see these days, if you went to like an IV bag, um, it actually might say DEHP free. Um, but just to give you an example of other places that these chemicals end up. And these are the six congeners that we examined in our seabirds to see if there was a way beyond looking inside a bird's stomach to see if it had ingested plastic, if there was a way beyond that to see if there was a toxicological consequence of plastic pollution in the ocean. And so we, we tried to quantify the concentrations of these um, six chemicals in muscle tissue from our seabirds. Hopefully that makes all, that all makes sense. I didn't wanna to dive too deeply into like how we do the chemical analyses, but um, that's Rachel in the picture. And she was one of the first undergrads to work with me. And I um, am so grateful <laughs> that she helped me uh, through all of that. Uh, this work wouldn't be possible without her. Let's see if we go to the next page. So um, quickly on what we found in terms of our results, um, and these results have actually been published in Marine Pollution Bulletin. So if anybody's interested in um, reading the paper later on, I can send it, to, send it out to be shared. Um, but we compared the sum of all six of those phthalate con congeners um, the means of the sum of those six phthalate congeners um, geographically. And then by like, um, we split our 10 species up into their feeding guilds. So um, we basically compared each bird by what kind of food they're eating in the environment. Um, geographically, we didn't find any differences in um, the total phthalate concentration. And to us that suggested that, uh, you know, these phthalates are ubiquitous in the environment right now in terms of their exposure across the Aleutian Islands. Um, we could dig a little more deeply into why that is. Um, at the moment, we, we've sort of kind of come to the place of, A, we probably need a little bit more data to, to think about this, um, but B, you know, the way the currents move around the Aleutians, it's probably the case that they're moving things pretty ubiquitously across those islands. Um, I'll also add, I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to put on here, this is um, a sample size of 115 individual birds. So when we broke it down by feeding guild, um, we found that the diving plankton feeders or the crested auklets um, had significantly higher total phthalate values um, in comparison to any of the other birds. Why that is, um, we could partially, um, why it is, 
we think that part of it has to do with the idea that a plankton eater um, might also be targeting microplastics that look like plankton. So specifically like picking them out of the environment. There's been some work that's come out um, in the past few years uh, considering why a bird or an, any particular animal might target a piece of plastic instead of a piece of food. And one of the, the suggestions is that when plastic is in the environment, it'll actually um, be biofouled, which means that small cellular organisms will grow on the plastic and then it'll start emitting olfactory cues that'll trick animals into thinking that those pieces of plastic are food. That hasn't been entirely confirmed yet, but I think it's a pretty decent uh, consideration. I, you know, I don't blame these animals for picking plastic out. Like, you know, you think about uh, the sea turtles consuming plastic bags that look like jellyfish. You know, they don't know what plastic is. They didn't invent it. And so how could you, how could you, you know, be surprised by them consuming these, these materials that are not food, but sure do look like it. When we broke it down by the specific congeners that we were looking at, um, the ones that really seemed to be most prevalent were DEHP and DBP. Um, we suggested that perhaps this is because they're just the most commonly used um, in plastic materials, DHP in particular. And we possibly, you know, going back, and if we were to do this all again, um, I would actually also look at the, um, the metabolite of DEHP, which is MEHP. So, you know, um, as these uh, chemicals start to get metabolized, they break down into smaller pieces, which are even more easily used up by the system. So um, in the future, I would probably also add MEHP to this list of things that we're looking at. Okay, so we looked at phthalates in the muscle tissues of our seabirds, but we also found phthalates in um, eggs from birds. So I was gifted um, six mer eggs on St. Paul Island and it actually just like the yolk from the eggs. Um, and we tested them for phthalates. And of course we found phthalates in the yolk. And this was a really important finding for, for me in terms of thinking about like these next steps and these broader impacts um, because something like a mer egg is actually a subsistence food on St. Paul Island and in other parts of Alaska. And so what does it mean when um, communities are trying to, you know, subsist on wildlife in their, in their ecosystem and yet these wildlife are exposed to these various chemicals. And I understand that, you know, there's concern over all sorts of contaminants in subsistence foods. Um, and it really was like just one other thing to consider like, oh man, here's another one that we have to think about in terms of what's in our food. But um, I thought it was an important uh, finding to say, you know, our our um, our seabird eggs on St. Paul do potentially have some of these chemicals in them. Um, I'll say that these values are in. It didn't copy correctly from my previous slide, but these values are in parts per billion, so it's pretty small. But it's not nothing. And also phthalates are not supposed to be in the environment anyway. Um, <laughs> and so in my mind, they should all be zeros in a perfect world, but they're not. Um, and so the other thing that I was considering sort of from the level of an ecologist was how would phthalate exposure during development impact seabird chicks? And while we don't know the answer to that, um, and I don't, I don't have a specific answer to it, it's just, you know, my research has been uh, the case of like, <laughs> <laughs> I come up with more questions than answers when I get to the end and have a have data. Um, but that's science and that's why I love it. Um, but there was an experiment um, back, this paper was published in 2012 where they exposed chicken eggs to um, phthalates. And even at the lowest possible dose of phthalate exposure, they had a significant reduction in hatching success, um, which is really important to consider. Uh, that, you know, who knows at what level these eggs can be exposed where you're not necessarily, you don't have the potential of impacting hatching success. Um, there are also for birds that did hatch um, at certain levels, 
there were these like awful birth defects um, where basically the chicks were born with like their insides out. And if you were a chick in the wild and you were born with your insides out, um, I don't think you're gonna survive. So um, these are, you know, these are possibilities that, that I haven't in my own research, haven't um, been able to get around to like thinking about or, or designing any study to, to better understand it when it comes to wild populations. Um, I do hope that someone in the future can do something like that and we can sort of consider more deeply what the implications are for phthalate exposure in wildlife. Right now, where phthalate studies are um, is really about tracking different wildlife populations that um, and quantifying phthalates in their tissues. Um, next steps would be like having the different wildlife and, and understanding sort of um, correlations with, um, you know, reproductive success or population success or population trends in the future. So why is it important um, that we're doing all of this in terms of wildlife, in terms of human populations? And um, one of the biggest things is that, you know, I'm, I'm talking to <laughs> ACAP folks and we're talking about toxins and contaminants, but phthalates are endocrine disrupting compounds. So um, when they enter into your system, um, your body gets confused and thinks that they are hormones and that, you know, and I'm sure I'm talking to a crowd that really understands, you know, what uh, endocrine disrupting compounds are and what they can do. Um, we don't know the broad scale impacts of phthalates um, in terms of their endocrine disruption in wildlife, but there have been lots of human medical studies that have come out in terms of considering what uh, phthalate exposure might do in humans. And it's been associated with, you know, and humans are complicated, of course, but um, there have been some associations with certain types of cancers, um, earlier puberty, reproductive issues, um, higher rates of infertility, and, and things to that effect. Um, so it begs the question of what, what could this possibly do to our wildlife populations also? And I don't have answers for it. Um, I'm just gonna let, let that question linger. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm looking at my time and I see I'm running low and I do wanna leave a little bit. I, I saw that some questions are popping up. Um, so I do wanna leave a little bit of time. Um, and I'll kind of leave it with one more big question. Um, how do we tackle such a huge issue like marine debris? Um, on St. Paul, we are working on a NOAA marine debris prevention project um, to try and reduce and prevent plastic packing ban pollution because that is like a very specific thing on St. Paul Island that has been an issue, especially um, because we have a fish processing plant on site but we also have catcher processors that are out in the Bering Sea around St. Paul Island um, that are often using plastic packing bands to close fish boxes, but will, I mean, I've found reams of plastic packing bands on the shore, um, but they have been found to entangle um, Northern fur seals, which are a very important subsistence resource and, and just cultural resource on St. Paul Island. Um, and I, while I have not removed a plastic packing band from a seal myself. I have watched our disentanglement team do it and it is not an easy process and it looks very painful for the poor seal. Um, so we are working really hard to, to try and sort of tackle this issue, which is not just St. Paul Island, it's St. Paul Island plus other stakeholders like um, you know land managers and fishing industry and so on. So this is still in process, but we, you know, I would, I would like to think that we are trying our best um, from island to, to do our part in this besides um, cleaning marine debris from shores. So this is one of our big ones and is it's what brings me hope. Um, I'm gonna skip over to this last picture because the other thing that brings me hope is um, working with youth to do these things. So these are some of the kids that worked on the Kodiak marine debris removal and man, were they troopers. Um, like I said, marine debris removal is hard work um, and we were working eight hour days, just like busting our butts to get debris off that shoreline. And they, you know, they got hurt. <laughs> it was rainy, um, it was cold and they hung in there and I'm super proud of them. Um, and it is part of why I keep doing the work that I'm doing in hopes that um, you know, there are 
there's a younger generation behind me who can also help solve this issue. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna say thank you. Um, I'll leave my contact info there for a second and um, maybe uh, if anybody wants to jump in or ask some questions, I'm more than happy to. Yeah, thanks so much, Veronica, for that excellent presentation and really covering all the bases there. Um, yeah, you're right. A couple questions did pop in, and uh, yeah, feel free to to add more to the list in the chat or the Q and A. But um, jumping back, kind of to an earlier section in your presentation, would you say that 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 uh, that pie chart you were showing about the different sources of plastic, micro uh, micro and macro plastics in marine environments, is consistent globally? That marine uh, that that fishing industry. Uh, is a, is a particularly large source or is St. Paul or Paul Island an exceptional circumstance given its location in the Bering Sea? So it's a little bit of both. Um, I think a lot of it depends on where you are in the world. Um, you're going to see uh, marine debris from fishing industry popping up as like a large part of what you're collecting off the shoreline. Um, in coastal communities, um, in you know more remote communities where you know like i think about the context that the bering sea is heavily fished right so you have trawling places where the fishing industry is big you're probably going to see a lot of debris also um i would say that that's by weight but it's really important to know that like the heaviest bits of this and the hardest things to get off the shoreline are some of these giant nets um i would say something like the california coast isn't going to be the same um mostly because you have you know, large populations there and you're going to see lots of like single use plastic um, polluting the shoreline. But in remote Alaska, remote, you know, Hawaii, Hawaii also gets subjected to lots of fishing gear. Um, those places they're going to see a lot of it. And I do think that it's really important to um, continue to try and get the industrial fishing industry involved in the conversation. Um, I will say that um, our CDQ on St. Paul, uh, Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association has been one of the biggest supporters in tackling the marine debris issue. Um, they often are, so, so when we get a NOAA marine debris removal grant, we have to actually have a match and CBSFA will provide most of the match through um, gear or paying laborers. Um, they've actually, <laughs> I think sometimes they get a little tired of me because I'm like, I have a new idea. Um, and they recently partnered with me and an organization called Blue Ocean Gear to test out these smart buoys. And the smart buoys are really cool because they, um, it's basically an effort to reduce uh, gear loss and they have all the antennas and all the fancy things in them. And they'll talk to um, the fishermen through an app and like give you like exact locations. And so, so it'll reduce time looking for your buoys and your gear, but also, you know, if something drifts, it doesn't have the potential of becoming ghost gear like it would if you didn't have those buoys telling you exactly where they were. Um, so, um, and then I'll also say, I, I kind of skipped over my plastic packing bands thing, um, but the manager of the Trident plant on island um, is definitely a white hat in all of this and has helped very much in terms of supporting our work and has like put um rules in place in his plant to say if you have waistbands coming off and like ending up on the ground you put them somewhere else and you put them out of the way and we're going to do something with them that's different rather than throwing them away with the potential to like you know um become debris um so it's it's like i have to <laughs> um we have to work hard to like work with these different stakeholders or or you know who's accountable in all of this um and make an effort to to tackle it from all all angles. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. It, it sounds like it, it'll be many, many faceted solutions in a lot of these conversations. Um, I'm seeing Asama's putting some additional resources in the chat. Right. I'll update the resources in a follow up email after this call. But just one last question um, that's come in here, just wondering about uh, is are some of these uh, the results from your study with seabirds? Are they is this would this be considered like a baseline to an ongoing uh, research? Will to, to see how these these quantities of phthalates continue or reference values, etc. I would very much. I mean, it's sad that my 
baseline isn't zero, right? Um, <laughs> I wish that the baseline was zero. Um, this would be considered a baseline because it's the first time that we've done this sort of work in Bering Sea seabirds. Um, and then, you know, going back 10 years from now to do a similar study um, to see how things have changed would be, I think, really valuable. Um, and also considering that the refuge does do population counts every year for, you know, the places that we go, you could you could potentially do a correlation like, oh, have seabirds declined in this time? And like, granted, um, wildlife is complex because they're, they're definitely subject to many, many, many uh, issues. I mean, shoot, a bird's immune system is insane and they can like, hold on to so many viruses without getting super sick or you know survive like three or four seasons without like having good food resources um but it would be interesting to say like well is this part of it like our our values went up and our birds declined like what do we you know um that's one of the things i've been learning also is is sort of this combination of local boots on the ground knowledge um and, and what those observations of patterns over time can tell you in conjunction with like the things that that the lab can tell us um, and how do they how do they kind of come together to give you like a more holistic story of what's going on in the environment um, so yeah I would consider them baseline um, and I'll, I'll send you my I'll send you my paper so that you can share it um, and make it available somewhere I just I should write a note to myself to do that. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk after that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll send out a, a follow up email um, with a link to a recording of this conversation and the presentation and uh, yeah, as well as an updated list of, of resources around this. Some of them come up in the chat and other ones in the presentation. And, um, and yeah, thanks so much, Veronica, for for joining us today and uh, and everyone in the audience and uh, for the questions. And um, just uh, one little last detail here. So an update on the, our next call, our next webinar is scheduled uh, for noon on Wednesday, August 18th. And um, it'll actually be also microplastic themed. We'll be talking with Dr. Sonia Nagorski from the University of Alaska Southeast. And uh, Nagorski has decades of experience studying water quality as an environmental geochemist, uh, but has recently turned her attention to the emerging issues of around microplastic contamination. So um, in particular, with a group of, of UAS undergraduates, Dr. Nagorski has been conducting investigations into the extent of microplastic occurrences in glaciers, rivers, beaches, even rain and snow uh, around Juneau. So another um, another local or lo another state state example for us to to keep the conversation going. So lastly, if uh, please donate to support these Che Alaska webinars and ACAT's other efforts, um, you can do that at our website akaction.org. And any additional questions or comments that we didn't have time for today, please uh, feel free to reach out to me um, by email or by phone here at nine zero seven. 222-7714, and I can try to answer them, ACAT staff, or even um, sending things along to uh, Veronica as needed. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, yeah, really have a, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Veronica. That was wonderful. Thank we'll you be in touch right. soon. Awesome work. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Sama.